counting down to India's 77th Independence Day and what a journey it has been. Not many people gave us a chance in 1947. They thought India would become another basket case. Too big a population, too many mouths to feed and not many resources to go around. But seven decades later, those doubts have disappeared. India is on course to becoming a major power. The only question is, by when? As the country celebrates another Independence Day, we are bringing you a flashback special, a series on India's many milestones. Our nuclear journey, our tech journey, also the unsung heroes who built this great country from scratch. We'll bring you an episode every week until the 15th of August, so make sure you catch all of them. It was May 11, 1998, like any other summer day in New Delhi. But late in the afternoon, there was some activity. Word spread that the Prime Minister had called a press conference. And no one knew why. Journalists gathered at the Prime Minister's residence on Racecourse Road. Atal Bihari Vajpayee was the Prime Minister then. He walked out to an expectant and curious crowd. And then he literally dropped a bomb. Today, at 15.45 hours, India conducted three underground nuclear tests in the Pokhran Lake. I warmly congratulate the scientists and engineers who have carried out these successful tests. Over the next two days, two more bombs would be tested. So five of them in three days. All of a sudden, India had entered an elite club. It was now a nuclear-armed state. The whole country was rejoicing, but in the West, the feeling was different. US President Bill Clinton was livid with his intelligence agency. How had they failed to monitor the tests in India? To give the White House a heads up. The answer lies deep inside the deserts of Rajasthan. But India's nuclear journey did not begin in 1998. It began 24 years before that, in the year 1974. That was India's first nuclear test. Why did India feel the need to acquire nuclear weapons? How did we hide the top secret mission from the world? Time for a flashback. You may not remember stories, but you do remember characters. India's nuclear story also has one such character, this man, Homi J. Baba. He was called the father of India's nuclear program. Baba studied in Cambridge. He had a PhD in nuclear physics. But in 1939, once the Second World War started, he returned to India. He had a great equation with Jawaharlal Nehru. He called the Prime Minister Bhai, meaning brother. Now friends meet. And when these two met, Baba had the same demand. Let us research nuclear energy. Give me funds to kickstart India's nuclear program. That's what he wanted, but Nehru was not a fan. He had this whole peaceful image going. So he wanted nothing to do with nuclear power. But in 1954, he relented. The Department of Atomic Energy was founded. Homi J. Baba became the director. His primary job was to explore the civilian uses of nuclear energy, things like power generation. But secretly, he also wanted to build a bomb. Nehru was still non-committal about that. He was talking about arms control at the United Nations, so he couldn't be seen building a bomb. Yet the times were about to change. The same year, in 1954, India got a nuclear reactor. It was called Cirrus. The US and Canada supplied it under the Atoms for Peace program, strictly for civilian use. But down the line, that would change. Homi Baba had accounted for this change in policy. Behind the scenes, he was laying the groundwork for the bomb, doing all the research, inviting foreign physicists, all he needed was a green signal from Delhi. It came, but at a steep cost. China attacked India in the year 1962. One year later, they tested their first nuclear bomb. In Delhi, alarm bells were ringing. We now had two hostile countries surrounding us. One of them was also a nuclear power. So Prime Minister Lal Bahadur Shastri had to make a call. He first appealed to nuclear powers. He said, guarantee our safety. But no one responded. So now the only option was a nuclear option. Just one problem though. The attitude towards nukes had changed by the late 1960s. The Non-Proliferation Treaty was signed in 1968. It set a deadline for nuclear powers. If you have tested before 1967, you are a nuclear power. If not, you cannot make a bomb. 
This deadline meant that there were five nuclear powers in the world, the US, the Soviet Union, the UK, France and China. If anyone else tested nuclear weapons, it would be illegal. That's what they decided. India never signed this deal. It considered the NPT, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, to be discriminatory. So the nuclear program continued to grow in India, but without its biggest proponent. Homi Baba died in the year 1966. His death is a whole different mystery, perhaps for another episode. But by now, the bomb was ready. It was only a question of dropping it. If there was any confusion left, it disappeared in 1971. India fought another war with Pakistan and finally the green light came. The date was May 18, 1974. The location was Pokhran in the deserts of Rajasthan. The bomb was called Smiling Buddha. Its design was very similar to Fat Man. The nuclear bomb dropped on Nagasaki. Only 75 engineers worked on this project. Within the government, barely anyone knew. Some claim even the defence minister did not know. Parts of the bomb came from different places. The implosion system from Chandigarh, the detonation system from Pune, and the plutonium from the Cirrus reactor. It was all assembled in Trombe, and from there taken to Pokhran. The test was a big success. India called it, quote-unquote, peaceful nuclear explosion. One with few military implications. But the rest of the world did not buy it. The West, led by the US and Canada, imposed major sanctions. The message was sent, though. India was not going to be a pushover. For the next 24 years, we had a gap in testing, though, sort of like a nuclear winter. So what forced New Delhi to resume it? Some worrying news from Pakistan. They began testing nuclear devices in the 1980s, so India responded in kind. We began building up our plutonium stockpiles. The next decade, the 1990s, was a geopolitical earthquake. The Soviet Union collapsed. India lost its biggest political and military supporter. Also, a new weapons control treaty was being discussed. It was called the CTBT, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. It would ban the testing of nuclear bombs and devices. So India had to act fast. In 1995, Prime Minister Narasimha Rao approved another test. All the preparations were made. The location was once again poker. And just one problem, though. The Americans were on to us. Their spy satellites spotted the work in Pokhran. Bill Clinton was president then. He feared a nuclear arms race between India and Pakistan. So what did he do? First, he sent the US ambassador on a mission. The ambassador showed satellite pictures of Pokhran to Indian officials. Then he spoke to Narsimha Rao on the phone. Long story short, the game was up. India decided to abandon the plan. But another opportunity presented itself in 1998. Atal Bihari Vajpayee was Prime Minister then. His party had made nuclear testing a campaign issue. This time, the challenge was clear. Testing the bomb was not enough. We had to hide it as well. So an elaborate plan was hatched. The work was only done at night. So the spy satellites above could not spot anything. In the morning, everything was put back in place. So when the satellite came around, there was nothing suspicious. Very Bollywood-like, I know. Along with the satellites, India also had to worry about airwaves. The Americans were listening to conversations, so code names were created. The detonation shafts were called White House, Whiskey, Taj Mahal and so on. When the scientists came, they were in disguise. APJ Abdul Kalam was one of them. He became Major General Prithvi Raj in Pokhran. Very few in the government knew about all of this, just the Prime Minister and his trusted colleagues. May 11th was the D-Day. Three bombs were tested on that day. Two more were tested on the 13th. And out of these, one was a fusion bomb. The rest were fission bombs. Quick science lesson now. Fusion and fission are two different processes. In fusion, you merge two or more atoms. In fission, you divide or split them. Both these processes generate a lot of energy, which is why nuclear bombs are so devastating. After the tests, a message was sent from Pokhran to New Delhi. It said, White House has collapsed. Not the one you're thinking of. This is the detonation shaft. The tests in 1998 were different from 1974. We did not call it a peaceful explosion this time. We did not hide the military applications. Instead, India declared itself a full-fledged nuclear state. In Washington, Bill Clinton lost it. He apparently said, we are going to come down on those guys like a ton of bricks. Well, India knew what to expect. It was largely a repeat of 1974. Western countries, led by the US, sanctioned us. One big difference, though. 
By 1998, India's economy was in a much better place. The sanctions came, but we were ready for them. Prime Minister Vajpayee declared a moratorium on nuclear tests. He said no more. He also spelled out the no first use doctrine. What does that mean? It means India will never use nuclear bombs first. We will only use it in response, to respond against a nuclear attack. Both those promises have been upheld. Governments have changed, leaders have changed, but India's nuclear weapons policy remains unchanged. Looking back, was all of this justified? Well, no country has dared to wage an all-out war against India. Plus, look at what's happening in Ukraine. They gave up their nuclear weapons in exchange for security guarantees. Two decades later, they are under attack. The same country that offered them guarantees is attacking them. Also, the Western outrage is long gone. Today, the US and Europe consider India to be their preferred Asian partner. So I guess there is no downside. India's pursuit of nuclear weapons was not based on hunger for power. It was not about entering a club. It was about self-defense, about preserving our security when surrounded by two hostile neighbors.